if you want to boil this down presentation into just two words, think of the words Gnostic origins. Gnostic origins. This is one of the aspects of my argument about universalism that I think is original, is that rather than going back to origin in the early church, the early church father, I go back before origin to the second century Gnostics. And the second to, group of two were to be Gnostic theology. I'm trying to show how there is, in fact, a different non-biblical theology that drives, Gnost- that drives universal salvation as a teaching. That this isn't simply a matter of biblical exegesis. That this is rooted in a particular way of understanding God and humanity. And I, I hope to show that. The, the, the book, as I intend to write it and publish it, the working title is The Devil's Redemption. And the subtitle is An, in, an Interpretation of the Christian Debate Over Universal Salvation. I have systematic chapters, constructive chapters, theological chapters, but what I'm going to be giving to you today is the historical part of the argument, just in summary. So let's have a word of prayer as we begin. Heavenly Father, we are very aware that, that we're in your presence right now and in this chapel. We ask for you to guide this time. I pray, pray that you would guide me as I do this presentation. And Father, we ask that uh, the name of Jesus Christ... And his work as Savior would be lifted up in a powerful way here in ATO Chapel. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would guide all that I have to say, and I pray that you would guide our our time of discussion today, and may it be to your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm referring to this as Christ between the thieves, a theological and pastoral response to Christian universalism. Let's go back a couple of years. Do you remember the controversy surrounding Rob Bell's book, Love Wins? Wasn't that long ago. Here's a picture of Rob Bell, and here is a, the cover of Time magazine, which raised the question, what if there is no hell? And then featured a favorable report on Rob Bell as one who was stirring up controversy and discussion within the evangelical world. Uh, Bell has, has subsequently stepped out of his position as pastor of the church in Grand Rapids, and uh, I, as far as I'm aware, I don't believe he's in pastoral ministry uh, at this point right now. But the book, of course, was on the New York Times bestseller list, created quite a stir. Of course, many of the ideas were not particularly new ideas, but uh, were newly packaged and presented by Bell. Here's a quotation from Bell's book. At the heart of this perspective, the perspective that he was presenting and advocating, is the belief that, given enough time, everybody will turn to God and find themselves in the joy and peace of God's presence. The love of God will melt every hard heart, and even the most depraved sinners will eventually give up their resistance and turn to God. Over on the other side, you see the cover of Mark Galley's response, which was not love wins, but God wins. Um, so we'd have to ask the question, is this, is this believable? Is this a believable point of view that all will make this decision to turn to God? Well, before we turn to that question, let me just define some key terms for the sake of the presentation. First of all, universalism, simply the teaching that all human beings, and perhaps we might say angels too, we think of them as intelligent, volitional beings, will finally attain to salvation with God in heaven. A purgatory, or what I sometimes refer to purgationism, that reflects the fact that there are multiple views, different ideas regarding the process of, of, of purification. That human beings who are not prepared for heaven will be prepared for heaven and enter it after being purged of sin and guilt through suffering, often described as a purifying fire. The second chance idea that people will somehow have an opportunity to hear about and to believe in Christ after the present life has ended. Annihilationism, that the wicked after being judged by God will simply cease to exist or be annihilated. And then I thought I would also throw in nirvana, uh, not the band, the state. A Hindu or Buddhist view that some human beings enter into a state of extinction where all desires cease and or the human being no longer exists. I think Professor Netland would have probably more to say than I on this uh, particular topic. But it's sometimes understood as personal, as extinction of individuality, sometimes as extinction of desire. Uh, l- let me add one thing that's not on the outline here, and that is the whole notion of the, the larger hope 
or what's sometimes referred to as Christian inclusivism. This is a notion that there will be more people in heaven than many uh, would expect, traditionally think. And I draw a rather clear distinction between universalism and the various forms of Christian inclusivism. And the reason for that is I think that universalism is a much stronger claim. Many of the universalists, some, some, excuse me, many of the inclusivists would say that there's a possibility for people to respond to Christ without actually hearing the name of Christ. Others might point to some post-mortem opportunity to respond to Christ. But in any case, what inclusivists are often concerned about is expanding the, the realm within which choice can be made. A universalist is, in effect, saying everyone will make the same choice, ultimately. So... My argument in this particular book is not really with inclusivism, although I think that's an important area that needs to be debated among Christians. My argument is really with universalism as such. Does universalism matter as a theological view? I think the answer is yes. And one of the reasons is because universalism is so closely connected to so many other Christian beliefs. The idea that you can accept all of evangelical teaching and then add universalism without shifting or altering anything else, I think is, is quite uh, mistaken. Because universalism raises questions about the very nature of God. How do we understand the mercy and justice of God? Does God punish sin? Does God exercise judgment? If so, how, when, where? What about the freedom of the creature? Is it possible that everyone says yes to God? Is there hardness of heart? Is there, is there permanent impenitence? Do the demons finally repent. What about Christ's atonement? What did Jesus accomplish on the cross? Was Christ punished? If not, then why did Jesus need to die? Then there's a question of the believer's sanctification. If everyone is saved in the end, what does this do to the motivation for avoiding sin, living in self-denial, and growing in the process of, of, of sanctification? And then finally, the church's commission. is: every, If everyone is saved, what motivation is there to make the difficult, dangerous, costly efforts to preach Christ to all nations and all people. So these, I think, are all important questions that are raised by universalism, which is directly linked to these many other theological issues. So let me introduce my particular argument, then, about universalism. That universalism may be traced back to ancient Gnosticism. See, if you bring up the topic of universalism, the first name that often comes up in, in theological, uh, theological circles is the name of Origen, the, early, the Alexandrian church father. But Origen was not the first universalist. The very first universalist in the history of religion seemed to have been the early second century Gnostics. Basilides, Carpocrates, um, those that were responsible for writing the, uh, the Apocryphon of John, some of them our names, some we don't know the names, but we have these ideas uh, present in the early second century, and Origen, in effect, picks up what is already part of his, uh, his environment. So you could say that, that universalism is born in Alexandria. As I'll say a little bit later, it's reborn in London in the early modern periods, but that's getting ahead of myself. Well, here's a quotation from the, the philosopher, Polish philosopher, Leitzak Kalakowski. And he describes a notion of an evolving God. And this is how he he puts it. He says, God brought the universe into being so that he might grow in its body. God needs his own alienated creatures to complete his own perfection. The growth of the universe involves God himself in the historical process. Consequently, God himself becomes historical. At the culmination of the process, he is not what he was at the beginning. He creates the world, and in reabsorbing it, enriches himself. Now, actually, Kalikowski is not defending this view. He's simply describing it. But this, can you see why this Gnostic view of God might lead one to believe in universal salvation? It just, just to summarize very briefly the idea that I'm going to be elaborating For in this worldview, in this Gnostic idea, the creature is not really something ultimately that is separate from God. The creature is an alienated aspect of God's own being. And God cannot remain alienated from God forever. So what becomes separated is then returned back to God. And I tried to illustrate this here. If you follow vertically along these two lines, Gnostic thought on the left and biblical thought on the right, Gnostic thought moves is a threefold movement from unity, diversity, to unity. 
in the beginning, God. There is God and spiritual reality unified. And then in the Gnostic worldview, there is a catastrophe, a crisis within the life of God. God begins to split apart. Don't worry, I'm not promoting this. I'm simply describing it. God splits apart. The particles of light fall, and as they fall in the metaphysical sense, they fall into physical bodies. But ultimately, that which is separated must come back together again. And I call it the boomerang theory. You know, if the boomerang is properly thrown, it will return to the center. Uh, on the right, we have, uh, looking at this, this uh, chart uh, vertically, um, we have creation, fall, and redemption. And note the color scheme that I'm using here. In order to take these two and to fit them together, which in effect I think is what Origen attempted to do in his thought, you have to connect diversity, movement into diversity with creation and fall. Creation and fall are basically collapsed together. They both represent diversity emerging out of unity. The unification is identified, correlated with redemption. The redemptive process in Gnostic thought is simply a coming together again. And then in order to have primal unity, what do you need? You need to posit something that doesn't exist in Scripture, which is a notion of a preexistent state. And this is precisely what we find in origin, the idea that before souls existed in the physical body, they existed in the spiritual realm in unity with God. And so that become, that's a way that, of connecting the Gnostic narrative with this, this three-part biblical narrative. And so, and ultimately, Gnosticism raises a lot of questions about good and, and evil and whether they're fully separate or can be separated from one another. So the original universe, or maybe I should, yeah, the original is origin here. Here's an artist rendering. And just a brief overview of origin because he is very important as a part of the story here. He was among the great scholars of the ancient church, suffered uh, persecution from the pagans and Yet he questioned God's justice, and Origen asked why some were born poor and others were born rich. Why were there these diversities that existed at the time of birth? And in his work, De, De Principis, or Peri Archon, would be the Greek title on first principles in English, Origen suggested that all souls were originally in unity with God. Then the souls fell, they were incarcerated in physical bodies as a punishment for their sins. The present world, he suggested, is just one of perhaps just one of many successive worlds. And over time, the sufferings of the present life and the fires of hell will consume the wood, hay, and stubble of sins. That's a reference, of course, to 1 Corinthians 3, as Origen interpreted it. And there will be purification. Even in hell, according to Origen, the lost have free will, and so they might, find, they might repent. And eventually all souls will return to God, even Satan and demons, and so the end is like the beginning. There was some debate. You know, Origen gave a lecture in Athens in which he said, according to report, that Satan will be saved. Later he said, I didn't say that. Only a lunatic would say that. But if you look at the argument really closely, what it seems like Origen is saying is that Satan is not saved as Satan. Lucifer is not saved as Lucifer. Well, Satan is not saved as Satan, that Satan will return to being the angel that he was before the fall. And in that restored state, he will be reconciled to God. So I think... There's some debate among the scholars over how to reconcile the different statements of origin, but that's the way. I, I believe that the evidence is that this was, in fact, origin's view. Of course, those of you who know early church history, you know that Rufinus doctored the writings of origin, too, and made it difficult for scholars of immemorial for all generations to try to figure this thing out. So, uh, or, Origin says the end is like the beginning. All souls come back into union with God. Again, that's the unity, diversity, unity narrative. His ideas were controversial. They were rejected at the Second Council of Constantinople. So the conclusion that I draw is that no, this notion of universal salvation it derives from a complicated story concerning preexistent souls and without this non-biblical and I think ultimately Gnostic element, Origen's view on universal salvation really doesn't hold up. The, the eschatology is driven by the protology. The view, vision of all souls united to God is driven by this notion that they can come together again because they were together at the beginning. Now, I'm going to move quickly through these next slides. I'd like to go in greater detail, but um, let, me, let me shift in light of the time we have to the modern. This is universalism part two. After the 
uh, the Fifth Ecumenical Council. Uh, we have some tolerance of universalism as a private opinion in Eastern Orthodoxy. This is often misunderstood. It was, universalism was not an official teaching of the Orthodox Church. That, this idea sort of emerged in recent generations. Oh, well, a lot of people accepted origin. And I went back in my research and I found in the 19th century that the, the Orthodox writers, Russian, Greek, and others, were scathing in what they had to say about origin. They didn't accept origin. And I found in, I read some of the Greek language uh, volumes of dogmatic theology written by Greek theologians of, of Greek Orthodox background. And it's like, it, when you read this stuff, they talk about heaven and hell. They sound just like a Calvinist or Lutheran or Roman Catholic. Um, there were some who held this as a private opinion. And then in the West, Augustine's views were very dominant in both the Catholic world and in the Protestant world regarding uh, the reality of heaven and hell as eternal states of separation from God. So to find uh, a shift, what the different lines of modern universalism that I looked at led me back to this somewhat obscure figure for most of us, Jakob Burma, who was this, sometimes referred to as the mystical cobbler of Gerlitz. I have a quotation from Paul Tillich, who was strongly influenced by, Paul, by, uh, by Friedrich Schelling, who was then a follower of Burma. The reunion with the eternal from which we come, from which we are separated, to which we shall return, is promised to everything that is. So that represents the, the reunification idea. There's an image, uh, a picture of, of Burma there. And these are some of the esoteric diagrams that appear in his writings. Well, Burma was a German visionary. He had a paranormal experience in the year 1600. And he claimed that this experience he had showed him the inner dimension of all reality. He, he was looking at a pewter dish, and the sunlight reflected off of the dish, and he said that he wasn't seeing just the light, but he was seeing the kind of inner reality of all things. And this, out of this, he developed a very uh, complicated theology. You know, one of the critics of Burma said that Burma, reading Burma is like going to a picnic, where he said the author supplied the words and the reader must supply the meanings. So Burma is notoriously different. I mean, I've read Hegel, I've read Heidegger. No one quite equals Burma, because you're reading along, and then he suddenly injects astrological and alchemical vocabulary. He says, you know, salt is to sulfur as, you know, darkness is to light and cold is to hot. And it's just, it's very, it's very difficult to, to piece it all together. And his interpretations of scripture, you know, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, or the same tree, you know, make these statements identifying things that are distinct in the biblical narrative. So um, he, he, he accepts all of scripture, but at the end of the day, the, the you know, Cyril O'Regan of Notre Dame calls it a, a reading of scripture that, that is characterized by what he calls narrative derangement. Because nothing is left, no stone is left unturned. Everything is shifted around within Burma's reading of scripture. And that's pretty much true of the, of the Bamanists as well. So one of his uh, unusual teachings, God himself as the Holy Trinity is born out of a chaos of darkness and agony that he calls the Ungrund. It might be translated as the abyss. So, so I like to say that Burma's Bible starts with the verse, in the beginning was waste and emptiness. So it's a very, uh, you know, the idea that, and, and, and there, you find writers who say, oh, he died in the fellowship of the Lutheran church. Well, not really. You know, it's like, well, like, there was some debate whether he could be buried and, you know, and with a, a, given a church funeral. But his thought is, in my view, very, very at, much at odds with uh, mainstream Christian teaching. Now, his followers were known as Baymanists. And what I discovered in my research, which was like, kind of like doing detective work, because I, I, be, I began to find that all these universalists in the 1700s, 1800s were all connected with one another. They were all connected because they all went back to Burma. They were all reading Burma or were reading one another in four countries. Well, actually five if you include America, Germany, uh, England, America, France, and Russia. So there's a German connection of Bayminists. Uh, to, toward the left here is is F.C. Uttinger, who was an influential author, very, very steeped in Burma's writings, who then influenced the philosopher Schelling and then Hegel. Gichtel, I don't have a picture of him, but there's a diagram from one of Gichtel's uh, works. And the third over from the left is the philosopher Schelling, is a young, dashing young man. He was a young rock star philosopher. Uh, he was younger than Hegel, but he made a big splash early on, but Hegel ultimately over the long haul proved to be far more influential, maybe the most influential 
philosopher of all in, in the modern period. And in my view, Hegel, what Hegel does is he takes universalism and he, puts it, he creates a Christocentric form of universalism in which the alienation within God that's reconciled takes place at the cross. The cross is the moment where God is alienated from God. And that alienation then is overcome. Hegel calls it the negation of the negation. Hegel's another difficult thinker, but in broad, broad terms, there's, an, there's a separation between father and son that's, that's reconciled. Then the spirit is poured out. There's a sort of universalistic logic of Hegel's thought in which all creation seems to be caught up in this movement. Uh, I, I call it the cross from above because the cross is not so much the story of God's reconciliation to a sinful humanity. It's God's reconciliation to God. There's some new work on Hegel. There's a book um, called the, uh, the, um, the uh, let's see, the Hermetic Hegel by a philosopher who looks at the Hermetic and the Gnostic background of Hegel. So not all the Hegel scholars accept that, but I think it's an important, uh, adds an important makes an important contribution to my argument here. And frankly, I think it may be in the background of Barth's notion of election, but we'll come to that. There's an English connection. John Portage uh, was a, a, a devout a follower of, uh, or I should say devout, devoted to, to Burma, to translating his works, expounding them. He was also a spiritualist. He was removed from his ministry in the Church of England for consorting with, uh, with spirits, angels, and demons. And the writings include many encounters with, with spirit beings. So this is permeates the, the Bamanist literature in England. Jane Led, a visionary, had visions that led her to her belief in universal salvation. William Law, who you may know of from his earlier years as the author of this work called A, a Serious uh, Call to a Devout and Holy Life. He, he had a major impact on John Wesley. And then in the latter part of his life, he fell under the influence of Burma, Jakob Burma. And he used almost sycophantic language. He referred to him as like my great and exalted master. And, and later, John Wesley wrote to Burma and said, what's wrong? Why are you so preoccupied with Burma? And, and, and he gave examples of Burma's rights. He says, I can't, this doesn't make any sense. You know, so sort of was expostulating with his former, former mentor. But Law's writings then did a lot to present Burma's ideas, and they had an influence on someone that you may have heard of, George MacDonald, the 19th century writer who then influenced C.S. Lewis. And George MacDonald became, was influenced by law, went back to read Burma after reading law, became convinced of universalism, and among other things, he railed at the idea of penal substitution. He thought it was an immoral, even a blasphemous teaching that God would pour out his wrath upon Christ. And so MacDonald held, like many of the Bamanists, that God's wrath and love were really indistinguishable, that what is referred to as wrath was a purifying love of God that would ultimately redeem all humanity and, uh, and even fallen angels bring them back into reconciliation with himself. There is a English-German-American connection through the 1700s. I, as I mentioned, yeah, the English Bamanists were engaged in spiritualism and then uh, the Philadelphian Society was formed by Jane Led, the prophetess. And as far as I can tell, this is the first universalist society. Universalism had, a, had existed as an opinion of a few isolated intellectuals, but there wasn't really a religious organization to carry forward this teaching before the time of Led. And so she formed this society. It didn't last long, but it, had a, it was a seminal influence in the spread of universalist ideas. And then her works were translated into German, and they went back to Germany and influenced some of the pietists in Germany, including Johann and Johanna Peterson. There are pictures of them here. Now, interestingly, they were both influenced by a, a German woman who, like Jane Led, claimed to be a prophetess, who had visions that convinced her of belief in universal salvation. So there's a common theme here of the sort of prophetic uh, sub, you know, subjective experiences leading people into this particular doctrinal belief. The French connection. Um, this is one of the more unusual things I discovered in my research. I, I, I found out that there were, were uh, French writers that were reading Burma, and I thought, I wonder if they were universalists. And so I did a Google search under Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin. I thought, I'll look under his name. The first hit I got was apocatastasis.org. 
which is the Greek word for universal salvation. I thought, aha, you know, everything is checking out here. All of these people were all connected with Burma. They were all linked into this esoteric thought, and they all ended up as universalists. Now, this group was even more unusual than the English Vaymanists. They, they started out as Freemasons, but they didn't like Freemasonry because it was too much of a social club. They wanted to be more religious. And so this Martin de, de Pascale, he's a very mysterious guy. No one even knows when he was born. He sort of shows up and... He kind of comes onto the historical stage. He's in his 50s. He has a certain story of his earlier life. No one really knows what's true about him. He's maybe one of these sort of self-invented characters. Um, so he, um, he developed these rituals that allegedly caused angels to appear visibly and wrote this, this, this unfinished work. It's called The Treatise on Reintegration. He claimed that his rituals went back not to the Old Testament but to Adam, that these were the original Adamic rituals in which angels would be summoned, and by performing these rituals, that they would repair the cosmos. They were high priests of the universe. The official title of this group is like the elect priests of the universe. So it's rather grandiose, to say the least. So he claimed that by these rituals, they would repair the breach between God and the fallen world. So ultimately, all, all would be saved. Again, this is straight out of Bamanist ideas that were developed by in, in France. And then Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin was influenced by Pascali, but then he discovered the writings of, of Jacob Burma, and he, he fell in love with Burma, and he translated Burma into French and, and spread this. And this is spreading all around at the time of the French Revolution. Now, interestingly, Bahmanism is spreading in Russia about the time of the Russian Revolution. Soloviev, a 19th century um, polymath, really wide, he's generally called a philosopher, but he really delved into many different uh, fields of study. He also went deep into Burma. He was interested in Gnosticism and went off to the British Library in London. And while he was sitting in the reading room of the British Library in London, he had a vision of Sophia, heavenly wisdom, appearing to him. She beckoned him to follow after her and this led him then to go to Egypt, and he went into the desert. He almost died in the desert in the search for esoteric uh, wisdom. And so he settled down a little bit, went to Moscow, gave some lectures there, on lectures on God-manhood. He had a big impact on Russian orthodoxy, which became permeated with some of these esoteric currents of thought as well. But essentially, Soloviev believed that nothing, no one could ever be fully separated from God. And, and one of the people influenced by him was the Sergei Bulgakov, who's one of the more important, more influential, maybe the most influential, uh, or one of the two most influential Russian thinkers of the 20th century. So let me just summarize this. Uh, Burma and Bahmanism. Even if the New Testament did not clearly deny the doctrine of universal salvation, we might still question this doctrine because it originated as a deduction from a non-biblical Gnostic set of assumptions about God and the world. Uh, for Gnostics, the creature is not separate from God. It's an aspect of God's own being, and it eventually must be reconciled to God. God cannot forever be alienated from God. And we also notice that the Bahmanists were deeply involved in magic, astrology, alchemy, spirituality. So, you know, is this an argument of guilt by association? Not really, because what I'm really arguing, not just is that that this view is associated with Gnosticism, but it actually comes directly out of Gnostic views concerning God, uh, the nature of God. When I started out in this research project, I thought I would be primarily looking at human freedom, the nature of humanity, as it would be an anthropology project. It became more and more uh, a project looking at the nature of God, which was a, a little bit of a surprise to me as I, as I pursued this. Now, we get into the 20th century, and there are a number of 20th century theologians who have either explicitly promoted universalism or else have in some way approached the universalist idea, suggesting that it's possible that all will be saved. We mentioned Bulgakov already, Karl Barth, the most in, put an asterisk next to his name, the most influential of all of them. There's an image of him on the left, Paul Tillich in the middle, that's Jürgen Moltmann on the right. I got to introduce him when he spoke at Duke University. Um, I was not aware of his his overt universalism at that point, because he's, much, he's more overt than Bart or um, Balthazar, just about anyone, very, very clear. Moltmann says all will be saved, including Satan, um, without, you know, full stop, no, no qualification. And then Adrian von Speer was the 
physician who is also a visionary, the recurrent theme in the lecture today, who had an influence on Hans Urs von Balthasar, the Catholic thinker. So a little bit about, Balth- about Bulgakov. He was a courageous witness for Christ in Stalinist Russia. He went in exile into Paris. He was one of those that was thrown out uh, of, uh, probably saved his life, being thrown out by Stalin rather than sent to the camp by Stalin. But when he was in exile in Paris, he wrote on the topic of the final salvation of the evil spirits. And what he proposed was that through a, great, a gradual painful repentance, Satan and other evil spirits will be restored to God. And Satan will have his throne in heaven once again. He suggested that John the Baptist will, will share the throne with Satan. I don't know where that comes from, but that's a little quirk of Bulgakov. So Satan fell, according to Bulgakov, because he, quote, he could not bear the extreme height to which he was raised by the creator. So it sounds like it's God's fault, right? Um, Satan suffers the torments of hell, but he says that these are torments of love, of the love of Satan, for his creator. Now, this is really kind of a little bit unusual. This is even different from some of the Orthodox because he's, he's looking at this from both sides. I mean, some of them, like Isaac of Nineveh, St. Isaac of Nineveh, said that God's love was experienced by the elect as joy and by the reprobate as torment. So, but Bogakov is not here talking about God's love for Satan, but Satan's love for God. He's saying Satan is internally tormented by his own love for God. And, so Bogakov seems to have it both ways, that God continues to love Satan, and even Satan, in some conflicted way, continues to love God. Satan suffers because he knows he's a mere creature. He seeks to conceal this. The knowledge of his creatureliness is hateful to him. He denies creatio ex nihilo, at least for himself. He is self-derived. So, but Bogakov says that the charade will come to an end. Why? Because of Bogakov's metaphysical assumptions. Evil does not have depth, I'm quoting, Evil is exhaustible, and it exhausts itself and becomes completely impotent. So just to conclude, Bulgakov, Satan's rebellion cannot last forever because evil itself ultimately runs out of steam. This is the implication of Bulgakov's metaphysical views. And he's actually drawing this from Gregory of Nyssa in the early church, who had a similar idea that evil simply cannot, that good endures eternally, but evil cannot endure eternally. It it's ultimately has to fail because it's deficient on a metaphysical level. Well, Bart, we could say a lot about Bart. We would say a lot at great length about Bart. He's the most influential 20th century theologian. He certainly might be read as a universalist, but there's great debate about his views. And I quote him directly. This is a direct quote from Bart regarding universalism. I do teach it, but I also do not teach it. <laughs> and uh, Bart wrote 500 tightly argued pages in, on the doctrine of election. He claims essentially that, that God did not predestine some individuals to salvation and then pass over others, the traditional Calvinistic view, but instead God chose Christ. Christ was both the reprobate one in his death and suffering and the elect one in his final victory. And Bart says that all of humanity is caught up in this movement from the no to the yes of God. He's very clear in insisting on universal election that takes place in Christ. And then Bart also says quite overtly in the same volume and other parts of the church dogmatics uh, that unbelief cannot be considered a final condition. He says that no believer can regard the, the unbelief of another as something settled. Now, you put that all together, it sounds like Bart must be universalism, but he draws back by saying that he could not be sure that one could hope for universal salvation. He certainly will not accept the label apokatastasis, that Greek word that is associated with origin and universal salvation. So he won't accept the label, but the substance of it seems to be there in uh, two, two, Volume 2, Part 2 of the Kirchliche Dogmatik, the Church Dogmatics. Also, I note that in this same volume, Bart says that election is to faith. So he's a good enough reader, close enough reader of Scripture to see the connection between election and faith. But then Bart doesn't explain. If everyone is elected and everyone is elected to faith, well, so Richard Dawkins is elected to faith. Christopher Hitchens is elected to faith. You know, so what does it... So, so at least in my reading of Bart, there's a little bit of an air of unreality here because he's making an assertion, but it's kind of hard to see how this squares with the empirical reality of people deciding and, and some, many, choosing uh, against faith. 
So Bart's views remain enigmatic in some respects, yet definitely there is a tilt toward universalism. Now, in the Catholic world today, we find at the beginning of the 21st century, uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar perhaps is the single most influential theologian. If you were to do a survey uh, in Catholic seminaries, St. Mary of the Lake, perhaps in Mundelein, or Catholic hierarchy, certainly uh, Catholic bishops around the world, many of them would point today not to Karl Rahner, the Jesuit theologian who was very influential 20, 30 years ago, but many would point to, to Balthasar as the most, single most influential Catholic theologian of the 20th century. Uh, Balthasar was a friend of Karl Barth's in, in Switzerland, so they're both Swiss, they both were directly connected. And there's, a, there's something of a difference between them, because whereas Barth pointed to Christ's work on the cross as the basis for a hope for universal salvation, Balthasar shifted attention from Good Friday to Holy Saturday. Whereas for Barth, it was on the cross that Jesus became totally identified with sin and with our God-forsakenness and took that out of the way. Balthazar shifts that to the next step and said, no, it's, when, it's during the descent to the realm of the dead. That's where this total identification, God-forsakenness, was taken on by Christ. So that, if you take Balthazar seriously, Christ's work did not end when he stretched out his hand and cried, it is finished. It actually continued into the realm of the dead. And remarkably enough, you notice how often we've talked about visionary experiences so far. Uh, Adrian von Speyer had visions that confirmed uh, some of uh, Balthazar's predilections uh, toward universal salvation. In fact, according to what I've read, she claimed to go to hell every, uh, every Holy Saturday and, or, or to Hades, into the realm of the dead. So she had experiences in which she, every year she had to make another trip. And um, so uh, Balthazar functioned as a sort of interviewer and amanuensis writing down these experiences. And he took these quite seriously and to the, although he's been criticized by, by many Catholics for this, he incorporated this into his theology. Now, what Balthazar said was not definitely affirming that everyone would be saved, but he said that we can have hope for it. And that's why the book title over on the left, Was dürfen wir hoffen, What May We Hope? And so it's really a, a, an argument about hope. One of, one of the arguments I can't really develop here today is whether hopeful universalism is really not wishful universalism. Because on my reading of scripture, hope is actually based upon divine promise. And where we don't have a promise of God, I'm not sure that hope can really flourish. So, so, and I'm, this isn't an original argument. It's based on some of the Catholic critiques of Balthazar, that he separated the promise of God from the hope that's rooted in promise. Well, to move closer to the milieu of a Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, evangelical universalism, a new phrase associated particularly with Robin Perry. Of course, it wasn't associated with the name of Robin Perry because he was publishing under a pseudonym for many years, Gregory MacDonald. I even found that uh, he disguised his voice at one point in doing a radio interview. Uh, this is when he was functioning as a book editor in England. Well, about three years ago, I believe it was, he came out of the closet. Uh, this is on his own um, website, identified, you know, I am Gregory MacDonald, um, so, of course, that was combined Gregory of Nyssa and George MacDonald. So put that together for Gregory MacDonald. Um, he is not as well known as Rob Bell on the popular level, but his works are much more substantive. And I have a couple of the, of the book covers here. The Evangelical Universalist, which is an exegetical study that, you know, to his credit, he goes all the way through the scriptures. He doesn't avoid any of the biblical books, including even the book of Revelation, and wants to make an exegetical case for universalism from Revelation. And when he comes to the Lake of Fire passages, he says that, and this is true of other universalists before him, God himself is the Lake of Fire. And so those thrown in the Lake of Fire go in and they become purified, and then they come out of the Lake of Fire, and he said, after that, they go and wash their robes so that they can go into the Holy City, Revelation chapter 22. So he's got some very complicated exegesis, particularly with regard to Revelation. But he looks at the Gospels, he develops universalist interpretations of all these passages. And then All Shall Be Well, the, tie, the book cover over on the right, this is a historical study. This is an edited volume that goes beginning with origin, goes all the way up to Moltmann. I don't think that book particularly succeeds because what you find is that the different universalists at different times actually have sometimes conflicting arguments or ways of defending the views. And some of the people included are not really universalists. So they were more in the category of larger hope or Christian inclusivist. 
but that's part of my debate in my own book. Well, one of the latest developments is what we might call a new charismatic universalism. We tend to think of Pentecostal charismatic Christians as less affected by the modern theological trends, but there is a new form of charismatic universalism. Uh, John Crowder, I, I was invited by a charismatic group to speak in, in uh, Arkansas, and the pastor that invited me, by the time I arrived down there, had become a universalist after he invited me to speak because he went to Branson, Missouri, heard John Crowder, and became... And so I had no idea about John Crowder, and then I began looking on, on the line, began reading some of his stuff. He's with this group called the Sons of Thunder, based out of Santa Cruz, California. His conference is features spiritual drunkenness, what he calls token the ghost, which is a way of getting high on God with the invisible substance of intoxicating presence of God that's shown by, I guess, imagining you have a marijuana joint in your hand. Uh, Part of his preaching is, he said, the cross of Christ makes it possible for us to have what he calls effortless union with God. If you say that there is anything that is required of a believer to do or if there's any exertion in the Christian life, in Crowder's view, you're preaching legalism, you're preaching works because it's completely free uh, and, and and again, there's no no exertion whatsoever. And now his his YouTube video, which is the basis of what I'm saying here, the, the hell trip goes back to, actually to Karl Barth, it's, well, he doesn't, he mentions Bart by name, but a lot of his argument is based on Bart, suggesting that everyone will be saved. His conferences are rather wild events. There's just a report in the British uh, press on the, the ravers who get high on God. I think that was the name of the article, dressing up here as a Franciscan. Um, my boss is a Franciscan, so I haven't showed this to him. See what he thinks about the, 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 uh, the mock Franciscans here. But... Um, he uses a cross like the one alongside of me as, and, as a prop, and he acts like it's a marijuana pipe and inhales and then staggers around. I, I met a, a young charismatic leader in Pennsylvania who had actually invited him to speak at conferences in his earlier days and said, well, you know, we had him with us for a while, but he became more and more extreme, and he seemed to be wanting to say more and more shocking things, and so they ultimately had to disfellowship with him. But he has, he has a growing following in certain you might say, the wild side of the charismatic uh, movement. So let's just summarize the theological situation today. Uh, In the early 21st century, there is a trend toward universalism that's increasingly well-established in virtually every major branch of a global church. Roman Catholic, as we've seen, Eastern Orthodox, mainline Protestant, Evangelical, and Pentecostal charismatic. And this trend runs against the historic consensus of virtually the entire church in its official teachings prior to the early 1900s. And so here's my somewhat satirical question. Is it not noteworthy that the truth of universal salvation should be rediscovered at a point in the church's history that's recognized as a time of moral laxity and cheap grace? It's like that phrase, you know, putting out, uh, putting out the fire with more gasoline. You know, we already have moral laxity, so this seems to be pushing even further in the same direction. What about sin and evil? There's a quotation from Kalikowski, this idea that that everything is finally digested, everything incorporated in the triumphal progress of the spirit. Struggle and contradiction, he says, will appear as an individual contribution to the same work of salvation. Now, Kalikowski is actually using this phrasing as an ex-Marxist. He wrote the three-volume Main Currents of Marxism work, probably the single most important study of Marxism and all of its permutations internationally. And he ends that book by saying that Marxism ends, he says, in the folly of human self-deification. So he was a Marxist who lost his faith, and he recognizes this idea of of uh, the final synthesis in which evil simply vanishes away is a great delusion. I think it's, it's pertinent for the discussion here today. What about evil? Think of how the human imagination has portrayed evil. And I would just raise the question whether or not artists have uh, recognized something that some preachers have forgotten, which is the evilness of evil. And I'm just going to move quickly through this so because I think I want to have time with you to discuss this, but I have some passages here that are talking about the the scriptural teaching on hell and on judgment. Uh, Let's turn to the theme of final impenitence. 
universalist origin, George MacDonald, Sergei Bulgakov, Rob Bell, they presume that God's love will eventually turn every heart toward himself. But let's think about the death of our Savior. Jesus died on the cross, and as he died, one thief alongside of him died cursing. And this man had the opportunity to encounter Jesus himself while on the cross. I have an image here. This is from the artist known only as Il Sadama, who did this particular painting in, uh, or I guess I should say a, a, a drawing, in the year uh, 1530, so it's of the impenitent thief. The Gospel of Luke tells us that two thieves were crucified alongside of Jesus. In the final moments of Jesus' earthly life, one thief spoke curses while another believed in Jesus. Both of them witnessed Jesus' holy suffering, but one failed to see Jesus for who he is. And as I've studied this and reflect on this passage, I think that the believing thief showed astonishing faith because he was affirming this dying man, this crucified man next to him, was the true and coming king. And he said, he appealed to him, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I think that's one of the most remarkable expressions of faith. At the time that the Jesus' own disciples had fled, and here's the man dying next to him, says, even though this man next to me is dying on the cross as I am, he is, he is the king, and I want to be remembered by him. Now, I would say that each of us ultimately are in the position of one or the other thief in our, in our response to Jesus. So where does this leave us? I think it, it brings us to a return to the cross and to embracing costly grace. I th- you know, the, the cross is where we see God's holy hatred of sin and his astonishing love for sinners. And throughout the history of the ancient and modern church, there's been a tendency to downplay the cross as something ugly, gory, and offensive. The Apostle Paul calls it a stumbling block. And so I see the prevalence of universalism at the beginning of the 21st century as just a new expression of an age-old struggle between cheap and costly grace. And to go back to Dietrich Bonhoeffer and words and phrases, ideas that I think are familiar to many of you. He speaks of cheap grace and costly grace. Cheap grace, he says, is the grace we give ourselves. It's Christian faith without repentance, Christian living without discipleship, the salvation message without judgment or hell, and Christianity without the cross. I I don't have the quotation from H. Richard Niebuhr, but I think most of you have heard that too. A, A God without wrath, you know this one, led men without sin into a kingdom without judgment by the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. So here you've taken the key elements of the gospel, God, Christ, humanity, and so on, and the kingdom, but you've taken off all the hard edges from it. And I think that's the same thing that is going on in universalism. So we need to recover the message of the cross and, and realize that we were redeemed not with silver or gold, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless the blood of Christ. So what did it cost? What did it cost for us to be saved? It's a horrible image. This is an image from the passion of the Christ. But let's look at this. Let's not look away. This is what, this is what our redemption meant. This is what our redemption required. It required Jesus' suffering. It required him to bear this. And I think if we lift up the cross and and understand that we must respond to what Jesus has done, I don't think there's a place for universalism. So I call all of you, call us all to really embrace the message of the cross once again, to make this central in our meditations, our prayers, our preaching, our teaching, and not to shortchange this. Because uh, uh, the church that, uh, it's only a church that has forgotten the message of the cross that could, that could even toy with the idea, I think, of universal salvation as a, as a biblical truth. And I won't end here because there's more beyond that, and that is uh, God's glory purchased for us by Jesus' suffering. So I'd like to stop there. Um, It's just about 2 o'clock exactly, and would love to have some uh, question and answers and some dialogue.
your comments and questions on what I presented. The okay. theological context, when we're speaking of universalism, we usually imply by the word universal salvation. Uh, just to clarify on your lecture, it seemed that you were distinguishing between uh, a Gnostic metaphysical universalism and then universal salvation. And if I'm hearing you rightly, you're saying that the argument of universal salvation largely derives from a commitment to the universal Gnosticism. Uh, would that be would that be a correct? Or could uh, you tease could you tease, could, tease out, this yeah. could you tease out the distinction a, a little bit more between this okay. universal Gnosticism and universal salvation? Right. And then to put it back to the, the beginning of the question, how in what sense would Rob Bell and his claims to universalism, universal salvation, even if he didn't claim to be a universalist, Gnostically speaking, in terms of the nature of God, how might he be susceptible to that critique? Okay, um, well, let's see. First of all, I guess what I'm saying is that salvation, uh, the idea of universal salvation seems to be rooted in, in philosophical assumptions and premises. I'm challenging the idea that this simply comes straight out of exegesis, that if we read the New Testament, read it closely, that now we could debate the, you know, the all passages in, in, in Paul, um, you know, as in, in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. I think you, you look closely at those passages and you see that what he's saying is that those, all of those in Adam die, all of those in Christ are made alive. And there's other passages, well, that, that's a whole discussion in itself. There's some good responses that, uh, that, that can be presented, I think, in terms of the Pauline passages. So I see, the, I see these philosophical assumptions about the nature of God as driving universalism. What, what I find in Rob Bell is it's eclectic, as you might expect. I don't think he's, he's totally committed himself to one or another model of how everyone will be saved. There's a, there's a broadly Bartian underpinning when he asks the question of the title of, of one of his chapters, does God get what God wants? And this notion, there's broadly a notion of, uh, God, of, of, of some kind of universal election. He toys with the idea of purgatory, of sort of purgationist process as we find in Origen. It doesn't seem necessarily to be committed to that. And then his exegesis of the, of the prodigal and the elder brother is very eccentric, to say the least, because he sees this as a, as a really a story of, uh, of, of, of final you know, reconciliation, I think interprets that. So there's a lot you could say about, about Bell. Um, plus, the, the fact, I mean, one person counted, I think the reviewer said there were 42 questions in the first chapter. So he's raising lots of questions without supplying answers, and I think maybe having the effect more of, of destabilizing some evangelical convictions about eschatology rather than necessarily supplying something else in place of that. Uh, your last statement kind of leads into my question, and that's, I was fascinated by the biographies of uh, the various theologians, and we really didn't have an opportunity to dig into that, uh, which would have been inappropriate for today. But did you find that there was a commonality of prompting questions from these theologians? I remember one specifically, uh, one of the theologians was dealing with the issue of the poor and the rich. You know, mm -hmm. why, why was it? And did you find that there was a commonality in that, that these theologians were asking and felt that their current theology did not answer those adequately, and therefore they referred to this theology of universalism? Yes, I think, the, I think you, you can say that. The, most scholars would say with regard to ancient Gnosticism that, the, that it was driven, that, you know, the theological or conceptual philosophical issue that drives it is a problem of evil. How can there be evil in the universe? And um, clearly, this is a problem for for everyone, you know. So, uh, whatever view answer you give to that, um, one person was speaking metaphorically. They said the problem is that, you know, uh, if you imagine that, you know, the evil of the universe is like the pit bull. So, is is the pit bull God's pet that He simply goes and sicks on whoever He wants? Well, that would bring evil so closely into connection with God that would raise questions about God's goodness. But then, if you say, on the other hand, what if God is the head of the household and the pit bull is roaming throughout the universe attacking children here and there and God is sort of wringing his hands, you know, upset about it but unable to do anything? Then you have the opposite problem where evil seems to be detached. So whichever way you think about evil, you have some kind of problem. But generally the tendency of the Gnostics was to see evil as originating within God and that there was both a light and a shadow dimension within God and that 
and that there was some, and then for some of these universalists, there was a sort of movement into darkness, but then a reconciliation of, of overcoming that. What you don't have is the notion of the creature as a fully independent reality that has the power to say no to God. The, the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard says, this is the cross on which philosophy hangs. He said that a creature can say no to the creator. Um, and I think that's implied in scripture. I think Kierkegaard is getting us right out of the Gospels. Is it, is it, yes, there is final impenitence. There really is the capacity of the creature to say no to God. And um, now I'm sounding like a raving free will person, right? And I'm a Calvinist. You know, I'm an Edwards scholar. So, so someone could, uh, could chide me for that. But, it, you know, you have to speak to the particular question at hand. And when the question, I think what you have in Bart is you have a false objectivity, as if, you know, that what Christ did on the cross somehow absorbs all of humanity, you know, you, me, and as I said, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and the Skeptical Society of Deerfield, Illinois, and everyone else is all caught up in something without having, you know, without their conscious knowledge, which in a way is very patronizing to those who don't believe, right? No, you don't believe, but, but you really do believe. Makes me think a little bit of Paul Tillich's idea, you know, kind of that ulti- everyone's ultimately concerned, you know. In that sense, everyone kind of has faith in some implicit sense. Well, not really. Not really. If you read the New Testament, if you look around you. Uh, Thanks so much for your presentation today. Um, I was interested in whether or not your research has taken you into universalism before the reemergence some. Um, I know... uh, a friend pointed me to a, uh, in the, the Chef Herzog encyclopedia um, mm-hmm. under universalism. Uh, there's some claims made regarding universalism in the early church. Uh, one claim specifically is that Origen's views kind of uh, originated with Clement. Uh, and then secondly, that four out of the six uh, theological schools in the early centuries were, un- were universalist in nature. Um, so I know some, uh, some have made the argument that kind of... Uh, this was very broad in the early centuries, and due to the fact that Rome kind of held to this uh, 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 eternal punishment view, that that came out a bit later. Uh, what have your discoveries revealed about that, and how would you answer uh, those charges? I've been to that website, too. <laughs> now, I recognize the four out of six reference. Uh, well, first of all, uh, going to Clement, I think Clement is uh, a bit of an ambiguous borderline case. Um, he's not as overt as, as Origen, at least as I read Origen. Um, uh, Clement's not as overt, but but Clement's premise is that all punishment is restorative in character. So if you start with that premise, then a God who punishes must be a God who restores, ultimately. Now, he doesn't follow that. He's, he was never reputed like Origen to have said that Satan will be saved, and, um, and, that all, and, and also it's, it's uh, uh, pretty clear in, in, the, in, the, in the De Principis, um, particularly if you look at the Greek, you know, the... the, the Portions of it. The other thing to look at is Jerome's correspondence, because Jerome did a whole translation of it into Latin. And Jerome has some really amazing things. Jerome even claims that Origen believed in reincarnation into animals, and which sounds like a full-blown kind of almost Hindu karmic scheme. It's pretty. It's pretty um, remarkable statement for those who would want to claim Origen. Um, the four out of six uh, theological schools. I think I don't think the evidence is is there for that. I, I couldn't give a real specific. Uh, response uh, on that, but th- the idea that that you know the early church was a universalist church, and then along came the big bad Augustine in City of God, you know, and just suddenly <clears throat> squelched that. This is completely contradicted by the evidence from the apostolic fathers. If you look at second century before Origen, there's n- zero evidence of any Christian belief in universalism prior to Origen's De Principis. So second century literature, you know, Tertullian, Justin Martyr, um, the epistles of, uh, uh, the, of Clement, first, so-called first and second Clement, um, epistle of Barnabas, hell, hell, hell. You have hell, heaven, judgment, fire. It's, it's pervasive throughout there. So, and what's remarkable then is that when universalism does appear, it appears, as I've argued, in connection with this, this, this schema of unity, diversity, unity, the pre-existence. Once you take that out of the picture, which cannot be, you can't prove pre-existent souls from Scripture, you don't really have the, you have, you've, you've significantly weakened the argument. I call it the originist dilemma. The problem of the originist 
is that Origen gave such with his threefold, you know, pre-existence and then bodies and then final restoration. He gave such a wonderfully systematically complete theology of universes. And the problem is that you can't prove it from scripture. And so the originists who wanted to hold to this could either hold to the system or they could say, we're going to base our views on scripture. They couldn't really do both. And so originists through the centuries have had this sort of dilemma of doing both those things at once. But if you go back to the second century literature, it's not a, it's not a large literature. It's a small set of writings that pretty much gives the light, the idea that, or, that universalism was the, uh, you know, was the view of the early church. And then, of course, there was another figure even more important named Jesus, and he ultimately should settle it for us pretty, uh, pretty clearly. Do you have any sense at all where Shaf Herzog would get that, that statement or where? Well, they're looking at certain, they're, first of all, they're in, for theological schools, they're including Edessa. They're looking at some of the Eastern yes. schools. And they're looking at particular representatives of those schools. Um, what I found, uh, because I, I'm in a historical theology department, like ya- Jacob or, or James of Sarog condemned who is from the, one of the most important Eastern theologians, condemned universalism. Um, so you, it's not at all the case that once you get, let's say, east of the Holy Land into the Mesopotamia, they're all universalists over there. There's really, there's, there's a lot more debate that's going on. Um, and then you have, uh, well, you have a, a number of people, Epiphanius, you know, taking on Origen. Anyway, you could go on and on with names in the early church, but it, there's quite a bit of debate. As soon as Origen's ideas about universal salvation begin to be, be disseminated, there's intense controversy. And there are splits, there are friendships that are broken, you know, they're, they're between uh, Jerome and some of his friends, because Jerome flip-flopped. He started defending Origen, and then he changed his view. Well, the fact that there's so much controversy is a clear indication that this wasn't the prevailing view prior to the time of Origen that either was something that hadn't been discussed or maybe more likely that, that there was a, almost an unspoken consensus of final twofold state. And then the other thing to respond to this, think about Judaism. The, the idea of universal salvation is not an idea within Second Temple Judaism. Um, it's very hard. I've gone through, I've looked closely. You get some notions of possible second chance, um, some notions of something like a purgatory, but the idea of universal salvation, the place where you find that in Judaism is in Kabbalah. And Kabbalah, although it claims to be ancient, is actually almost certainly a medieval forgery. In Kabbalah, you have the doctrine of reincarnation, Gilgal, the notion of a transmigration of souls in which everyone will come back. And you also have something that's remarkably Gnostic, the idea that God himself, the Shekinah, is in exile. Not only God's people, the Jews, in exile, but the Shekinah is in exile. And the Jewish people, by their obedience, actually restore God to tikkun is the term for restoration of the cosmos. Very similar idea to what we see in Gnosticism. So you look at the Jewish evidence, um, it actually confirms, the, I think, the basic hypothesis that I'm arguing. Thank you. But we'll see if I convince everyone. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I know I'm not alone in saying that I'm sure we'll be praying for the completion of your work. Thank which you. Is a blessing to the church. Um, my question is different. Um, is there a commonality you found uh, among groups of people believing in this kind of universalism as regards the kind of worship that takes place once they believe this? I mean, how does the worship of the church change? Or what, um, how does the church um, respond to a God of this nature, and how is it different? Um, I guess historically and then uh, presently among the you know Roman Catholic main main line evangelical churches uh, are the commonalities among right. them uh, in, in terms of their of their gathered worship well I would ha- I'd have to think about your question I'm not sure anything immediately comes to mind in terms of a, a difference in worship because we do have you know some Orthodox who are convinced of, of this view, Gregory of Nyssa, you know, uh, Isaac of Nineveh. Also, uh, Bishop Hilarion, uh, Hieromonk is his title, Hieromonk Hilarion Alfayev, who's the, uh, with the uh, Metropolitan, sort of the leader of the, of the, of the Moscow Patriarchate. He's uh, responsible for external uh, relations, and he has doctors both from Oxford and the Sorbonne, very highly educated, and he takes Christ's harrowing of hell 
and he universalizes that in a way that I don't think you find in the, you know, in the early church. He cites the Gospel of Nicodemus, but not one of the canonical Gospels. If you get into the apocryphal Gospels, you could support a lot of things, right? Because they're so diverse, going so many different ways. But Alpha Yev would be another. But, but again, I don't see that there, there are differences. Um, I don't know about Rob, Rob and Perry's personal worship life, uh, what, where he is in Fellowship Church of England or a descending group over in England. I don't really see, or Rob Bell for that matter. I don't know what Rob Bell's worship life is like. Um, we see a very big difference in terms of evangelism. And this became clear in the, in the mid to late 20th century with the impact of Karl Barth's theology on uh, mission in mainline Protestant context. Barth was pretty clear at various points in the church dogmatics that evangelism is not calling people to a decision as much as announcing them about God's decision. God has decided for you. And so everyone was reconciled, but some knew it and some didn't. Emil Brunner said in dismay, this is like the notion that everyone feels like they're drowning, but they're not. There's only a shallow, like there's six inches of water, and people are saying, you know, save me, save me. But there's actually no danger. So, and, and Brunner, in his, his first response to Bart, ultimately he sort of swung a little bit in Bart's direction, I think, on this. But he said that Bart is the most radical universe that's far more radical than Origen. Because Origen never said that non-believers would be swept into heaven. He thought that the process of purgation, maybe over hundreds of thousands or millions of years, would ultimately bring this change of heart in everyone. Uh, but Bart seems to suggest that everyone, believer and non-believer alike, is sort of swept up together into heaven. So I think the implications for evangelism are very, very significant, and I think will be very stark if the Rob Bell and the Universalist message should prevail in evangelical circles. I think we would have the same... Same phenomenon. You know, in 1970s, there was a so-called moratorium, call for moratorium on missions. And that was driven by concerns about Western colonialism, but also on an underlying level by some of these theological questions about uh, the very nature of evangelism. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about how, how would you speak to a Catholic audience um, that has a popular... Because I know there's a huge difference between popular Catholicism and um, what is official and then what really is official or whatever. But how do you speak to, to an audience with a belief in purgatory and kind of that popular notion of it? Is that connected to universalism? Can it be? I mean, you spoke about this a bit, but c- coming from a country that's, that's popular Catholic, not necessarily really knowing any of the doctrines of the church for that matter, right. how would you speak to that and how would you answer someone that says, well, you know, because th- there kind of is this universalist mm-hmm. belief in a mm-hmm. sense, mm-hmm. Um, but not well defined. I wonder if, if, if you just have some thoughts on that. I know you're surrounded by right. Catholic theology. Sure, how would you? sure. Well, let's see. I'm trying to think of how to be concise on this, on yeah, the response to Catholicism. Um, Catholicism traditionally, well, from the high Middle Ages, it's taught three destinations. Um, the Catholic Church is very clear if you look, for instance, the Catechism of the Catholic Church about the reality of hell. Hell exists. That's not in doubt. Um, people like Balthazar are skirting the edge of that by saying, ah, oh, well, hell exists, but the question is, like, who is in hell? You know, how many are actually there? And so Balthazar is very careful not to directly deny that hell exists, but because that's directly condemned. If you get Denzinger's Anchoridium Symbolorum, you know, sort of the collection of the official you know, teachings of the Catholic Church going back to the early councils and then the, you know, the Lateran and so on, modern Catholic decrees and councils, it's very clear about that. So, so he simply says that we may hope for it, and so he's sort of skirting um, the edge at that point. But um, the, 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 one of the issues with the doctrine of purgatory is that it's being in many ways increasingly abandoned by the Catholic Church at the same time that Protestants are starting to Embrace it for the first time. It's very ironic. It's a crisscross. A lot of one of these other crisscrosses that are happening. Jerry Walls, who's a professor at um, at Asbury, philosopher there, has written a Protestant appreciation of purgatory. Now, what's ironic is our our current pope, or should I call him the former pope? No, I guess he's pope for about another week. Okay, so he's still Benedict. And by the way, my boss, my department chair, drank beer with him back in the 60s when he wanted to come study with 
with Ratzinger, and Ratzinger said, no, I'm about to be called to Rome. This is when he became the head of C CDF, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. So he didn't know it, but he was drinking beer, you know, tipping a brew brewski with the, former, with the future pope. Well, we'll see who becomes the new, the new pontiff. But in any case, Ratzinger, if you look at his book on eschatology, which is one of his better-received, more influential works, he basically redefines purgatory not as a state, but as a sort of illuminating presence of God that purifies from sin. And it's not really a, dura a durative state. It's more of a... a tra so he's, he seems to have completely reinterpreted purgatory in a different way. So that it's almost like, you know, what evangelicals believe about, you know, in the twinkling of an eye being transformed. That's almost what purgatory is now becoming for some Catholic theologians. So I, I think we're in a fluid uh, situation. Um, I, I know some, for some traditional, it's interesting, some traditional Catholics and some evangelicals want to agree that Rome never changes, you, you know, as the church is always taught. Well, actually, you spend much time looking at the historical evidence, there are a lot of things that have changed, right, over time. So a lot of things that have changed here, you know, sort of evangelicals change, Catholics change. So it's a, it's a, it's a fluid situation. But the Catholic church, in, in its, the main line of its teaching, has, has continually insisted together with the Gospels that there is a human decision to be made that has eternal consequences. And even though evangelicals and the more traditional Catholics maybe wanting to hold on to traditional purgatory teaching could disagree over that particular element of doctrine, I think they can agree, they can agree to disagree with the Rob Bells and the Robin Perrys and the others promoting universal salvation. Could you speak a little bit more into uh, the Cappadocians? Uh, you, we've been throwing around Gregory of Nyssa, um, and I know Nancy Hansis kind of flirted a little bit mm -hmm. with the idea. Can you speak a little bit more into, because they, they, as I understand it, they uphold a lot of orthodoxy, mm -hmm. um, specifically regarding the Trinity, but they also seem to import, at least linguistically, this kind of like hi hierarchical trinity at some, like, mm -hmm. in some forms. And can you relate that to maybe Nissa's view or how he develops the view of uh, upper uh, catastasis? Okay. I don't know I can do the whole trinity here, uh, no. Dr. Trinity. But, but in terms of this specific issue of universalism, they, you'd have to say something different about each of the three you mentioned, about Basil, about Nazianzen, and about, uh, about Nissa. Okay, Nyssa is, is a universalist, but he's, he's a universalist who is uh, emerging um, at the time that Origen's views were already controversial. And what he recognizes as most controversial is, is the theory of pre-existent souls. And so essentially what you have in Nyssa is you have, he wants to affirm the outcome without the, you know, the eschatology, without the, what I'm calling the protology, the, the, the back story. The, the, and I'm not sure that it really works as well. I think his theory is driven by this metaphysical notion that evil wears out, evil breaks down, evil cannot abide, that good can. But, but he's the most overtly universalist. Basil's the other side. Basil clearly taught heaven and hell, taught them as distinct. And some think that it was his you know, relationship with his brother uh, uh, or his relationship with, um, with um, Nyssa that actually helped Nyssa escape coming under censure. And then Nazianzen seems to toy with universalism, but he, 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 he steps back from it and, and sort of leaves it as a kind of un, unresolved, doesn't, doesn't directly affirm it. But Nyssa, if you, if you want, in the orthodox context, that people will cite Nyssa say, well, here he is, he was never condemned, right, as Origen was, and yet held to universalism. Yeah, but, but how many since then have there been? I mean, this is the thing, is it's, it's not and again, I mean, I was astounded when I read the Greek language stuff that almost no one reads. I mean, Greek, 19th century Greek dogmatic volumes. And they say some will go into eternal fire and some will go into eternal heaven. I mean, it's as stark as anything. So, so much for the idea that it all comes from Augustine. These are people that are writing on the basis of, of their reading of Scripture and their interpretation of the Orthodox tradition. So Origen's reputation... And with him, like people like Nyssa, who also are universalists, was really rehabilitated in the mid and late 20th century, and not primarily by Orthodox, but by French scholars, particularly the French, like uh, Henry Cruzel and uh, Jean Daniello, who was a, so, uh, the, Daniello was a car, later, later cardinal and uh, Jesuit. But it really was these Frenchmen that went back, and there was a sort of origin revival in the mid 20th century. Another aspect of that would be Teilhard de Chardin, who is a 20th century Catholic thinker, 
who revives a sort of cosmic vision of origin and, and it, it as a way of synthesizing together religion and science. So someone needs to do a good dissertation on the Catholic, on origin redivivus, the sort of the revival of origin in the 20th century on the Catholic side. So, but you go back before the 20th century, particularly the early 20th century and earlier, you don't find a lot of positive things. People want to stay away from origin. Origin now is cool. He's chic. People want to be connected with him. That wasn't true uh, even 50 years ago. We have time for one more question? My, my, question, my question is how, how do they balance the uh, good and evil and the universalism? It sounds more um, very yin-yangish. Um, either they, either if you get into that notion of, of cheap grace, then it sounds like it's, it's going to constantly make that roller coaster ride down into evil or it, it, dumbing down what, what is uh, holiness. Um, okay, so could you, could you rephrase that again? So you're asking how... How do they balance good and evil? Because uh, what it sounds like is everything is eventually becoming uh, evil is okay or... Um, Wrong is, is mm-hmm. just as okay as, as good. Well, it, it, how do they balance? Well, it, it, is, it is a... Uh, evil and good are ultimately connected with one another, I think. And I'm, I'm just kind of repeating you know, things I said earlier, but um, there is a movement within God, God's own being that evil sort of emerges um, You have even a hint of this, even in Balthazar's teaching, surprisingly. Balthazar has a notion of what he calls urkenosis. The kenosis, the emptying that we read of in Philippians 2, where it says he emptied himself, ekenosin is a Greek, taking the form of a servant. That's the incarnation. Balthazar says, and maybe this is indirectly answer your question, that prior to that there was a primordial movement in which the father begat the son, and he had to, to beget the son, he had to empty himself of all his being or essence in some way in order to beget, he had to diminish himself in order to beget the son. And he said that created what he calls distance within God within which evil could emerge. Well, that sounds like the fall happens not in the Garden of Eden, but within God's own being. And that has a Gnostic sound to it. It's not something that I see in the biblical notion of God. As I, I mean, I don't know that we can really explain the eternal begetting of the Son by the Father, but the, the language of the Nicene Creed is God from God, light from God, light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Light from light, it seems to be superfluid. It seems to be the overflow of the Father's being in which the Father is begotten as another, as distinct from himself. It doesn't seem the Father is diminished in any way. So I think any view in which there's some crisis within God and God becomes divided against himself is problematic from the point of view of the biblical message. And when you come back to it, every single universalist that I've talked about, including Bart, posits some kind of a split within God. I think that one of the problems in Bart's reprobate you know, elect, I think that way of reading election and reading Christ suggests a split within the Trinity. Because they, as Jesus is the reprobate one, he's split from the Father. If we understand salvation as the undivided work of Father, Son, and Spirit, the Father gives the Son, the Son gives himself in dying upon the cross, the Spirit is given and pouring out on Pentecost. We understand the, all three involved. We don't have a split within God's own nature. And, and so I think we don't, we don't end up with the same, the same dilemma, same problem that we find in the universalists.